All right. Well, yeah, okay. Um, first, what are your name, your personal pronouns, and your indigenous nation? Okay. Well, my name is Becky Thomas, my maiden name, Miss Yair. That's a French name, my husband. Um, I am a member of the Clifton Choctaw tribe. Um, I'm also Choctaw on my father's side, um, and most of his family live now in Oklahoma. Okay. And where are you from and where do you reside now? Well, I'm originally from Rapids Parish, a small community. Um, the um, border of literally on the border of Rapids Parish and Vernon Parish. It's a very rural area which in which I grew up in. Um, very small. Um, What's very, the name of the place, if you don't mind? So. Um, I think the actual name is, it's going to be listed under Boyce area, but being rural and remote, it's actually Clifton Choctaw. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And where do you live now? I currently live in Natchitoches Parish. Um, after I got my master's degree in social work, then I moved um, here in Natchitoches. Uh, actually, it's kind of just across the way from Clifton. Um, and we have 40 acres here in a farm. So that's where I live right now. Oh, nice. Yeah. So not too far away from, from where I grew up. I love the country. That's awesome. Uh, could you please tell us your life story in about three minutes? Like, what's a short version of your life story, Becky? Okay, I can give you the short version, which is uh, growing up in Clifton. And then I'll go on to become a Native American artist. Sure um, growing, up, growing up in Clifton um, was interesting because I grew up around family and we did have traditions such as um, we would eat things like what's called the green corn. Um, we had a certain way we would prepare that. Um, we would get it when it was kind of green still on the stalk. Um, they would boil it down and it made like this mush. And that's what we would eat growing up as a child. I assumed that the rest of the world ate the same thing. <laughs> but it wasn't until I became an adult that I realized, wait, they have no clue what I'm talking about. So that was one of the uh, indigenous traditions um, and food ways. But um, when, it, when we were little, we would all get together with cousins and friends and you know play, go play in the woods. We did gather berries, believe it or not. Uh, my mom's side were pretty big on honey, so they always hunted. Um, but of course, also growing up in a rural area, we had things uh, we had things that we could do that regular children didn't. But we didn't have access to cable TV or things like that. Matter of fact, they didn't get electricity out in Clifton until 1960. Wow. Exactly. Um, I was born in 1975, so it was just a little bit before me. Um, then when I got probably around 10, 11 years old, um, my great aunt uh, on my dad's side, Pearl Tyler, was making Native American um, baskets, which was pine needle baskets. And my mom learned from her. And so me being little and kind of just hanging around, I learned from them. That was probably around the age of 10 or 11. So as time went by and moving into adulthood, that's when I actually absolutely loved to do the Native American uh, basket weaving. For me, it was a form of therapy. Um, and I always loved to challenge myself. So um, eventually I ended up um, becoming a master uh, basket maker. Um, only a few of us left in the South that actually belong to a tribe that still practice that um, Native American basket weaving. And so um, later on, I still do basket weaving. I still do that. I've attended, you know, plenty, plenty of festivals, excuse me. Um, I've had stuff in museums in New Orleans and Europe and different places like that. Um, but now I'm also a social worker. Um, and I, anytime I get a chance to, I'd love to give back to tribes and, you know, work for free. Um, could you tell us, please, what, what is important to you? And what's important to me is passing on traditions, people understanding and knowing the struggles Native Americans have had. And I say especially Louisiana because 
most people think that because you're from Louisiana, you're automatically Creole or you're automatically um, grouped as, you know, Acadian or something like that. But my goal is to let people know, no, Louisiana has a large indigenous population, always has historically and presently. Um, you can never judge somebody by the way they look or talk or where they come from. You just don't know their background. Um, and for me, that's extremely important is to educate people on indigenous people and the lives they live and still the struggles we have today. Speaking of that, uh, Becky, what is your own sense of indigenous personal identity? I personally and have always grew up Choctaw, especially with my dad. Um, my great uncle, Paul Thomas Jr., he spoke a little bit of Choctaw. We didn't learn. I've learned a little since I've become a little older, but um, growing up, I was always grew up indigenous, always. I always, you know, said I was Native American. That was never a, a, a question. Uh, it was actually kind of funny because the area I grew up in, we were the only little shade of color. It was and actually about 20 miles all the way around us. We grew up in a southern white area. And then, you know, here we were a different population altogether. So do you feel like you didn't, I think probably maybe because you were like, as you said, this only sort of community of color in the area, did that so it seems like you didn't really struggle with having to identify as Native when you were growing up. Oh, no, we did. We did. You as, did. And, okay. and Can you tell us about very those much so. Oh, absolutely. Um, all the way. Matter of fact, my dad tells a story of when I was a, still a baby and apparently something had happened. They had to take me to the local hospital. And um, an African-American lady automatically assumed that we were um, African-American and, and white, never even asked. So when my dad, you know, gets the information and stuff, he saw on there where they put us down as African-American and he tried to explain to her that, no, we are, you know, Native American people. And it wasn't just little instances like that. Even being in school, you had tons and tons of people that would call you mulatto or you're a mixed race. I mean, pretty much anything but what but, you know, and on the other hand of that, then they would say, hey, yeah, I heard y'all were Indian, but uh, all the Indians have been um, conquered and they're in Oklahoma now. <laughs> so it, was, it was a rough child growing up because you have these mindsets of Westerns, I think, that gave people an idea of something that was totally not true. Um, that's really interesting. Do you think that... Um... Do you embrace any sort of identity other than native? Like, so like many people, um, my tribal cousin, Andrew Jolivet, uh, mm -hmm. who's wrote, you know, an entire oh, book. Uh, mm -hmm. So Andrew wrote an entire book on the native aspects of Louisiana Creoles. And one of the things he noticed that many people like members of my family, members of his family, um, mm -hmm. you know, would say like, well, I'm native and Creole. Did you kind mm -hmm. of have that identity or were you, you know, did your um, family think of themselves, prim you know, primarily that, like if someone asked a member of your family, what is your ethnicity? Is that the only answer they usually give is native or Indian or something? That's the only answer they'll usually give. But here's kind of how the Creole comes into our family. Um, back in about 1830, there was a Creole lady. I mean, there was a lady named Catherine Clifton who married um, Matthew Jones. This is, we're talking about early 1800s. Well, later, about 1850, they moved to what is here, Natchitoches, and they move into a identified Creole area. So, of course, later on, they identified as Creole because Matthew Jones was African, half African, and half white. Okay. Catherine Clinton was part of our house. So, as time goes by, we have lots of family that married into that Jones line that do identify as Creole. So there has been many, many instances where people say, oh, y'all Creole. But when in fact, we're not, but certain lines of the community 
are identified as Creole because of that early on, you know, that early marrying in. And okay. so, yes, there are times when I'm sure most say Native American, but then those that's married into the Creole community, they do claim Creole and Native American. Okay. Um, that's interesting. Um, you, what, I mean, you mentioned basket weaving, you mentioned that you, you know, ate indigenous foods. You mentioned that you know a little bit of uh, Chata Numpa, Chata language. Just in general, though, what indigenous cultural practices do you engage in regularly? Um, regularly, I practice Native American steel to this day. So that would probably be the only one that I'm familiar with and connected to. Um, because that's the way I was raised and kind of didn't deviate from that just simply because of the way um, with my dad and my mother. So, so, but like what sorts of things like do you like, like do you do foraging? Do you oh, I got dance? You. Do you sing? Um, things like no, that. No, my, I don't personally. My father's side does. Uh, the ones that live in Oklahoma. Yeah. They do. They still, you know, they, they're involved in stickball, you know, singing, they do powwows, that type of thing. I personally don't because I, I never learned that. Um, they did. Um, but currently and today, um, really what I still do is my Native American artwork. I still do the baskets. I actually go out and gather the straw in the woods. I get a permit from the National Park Service, being indigenous, to gather the straw. And so I still do that. And I do teach some classes on basket weaving. Okay. Well, it's really, uh, what, what is that experience like of teaching um, as opposed to just practicing? Uh, how has the practice of teaching uh, affected you over the years? Teaching allows two things, allows me to be able to teach other people the American Indian ways. Um, also, um, it doesn't really bother me to teach. I enjoy it because usually it takes me, I usually do it within a day when I teach. That gives me every opportunity to teach other people about Native Americans. That gives me opportunities to understand their feelings and take on Native American people. And it also gives me an opportunity to kind of let them understand where I've come from and some of the other struggles. Because believe it or not, 90% of my clients are of Caucasian descent. Yeah. And so again, that gives me the opportunity to, to you know, educate them better on Louisiana Native Americans. Because a lot of people don't understand that when you live in Louisiana, it really is the melting pot. There's a lot of different avenues to go into Native American. What are some common attitudes you get from the students towards, you know, Native people? A lot of the attitudes is, oh, well, I didn't know that. I just assumed that all the Native Americans were of federal tribes. And, you know, I just assumed everybody got paid to go to school and paid to do this. I said, no, that is far from the actual truth. Each and every federal tribe I let them know is different in how they do things. But their main attitudes are they feel connected when I'm teaching them how to do the basket weaving and letting them know I still do it the traditional way of gathering these materials going out in the woods so it's a very positive experience for just about anybody who's taken the class I've never really had anything negative because they take away knowledge they take away a new craft and you know understanding that's really interesting you talking about gathering the materials uh, when I've worked on uh, any kind of traditional craft work where we have gathered the materials, uh, especially palmetto. Oh yeah, I Did sometimes <laughs> I sometimes think of that as an art in and of itself because it's it is it's really kind of a lot to know about how to select things, how to cut them, how to preserve and process them before you even do anything with them. Can you talk a little bit about that process that you go through with the pine? Sure. What I do is normally we try and gather in the fall. And the purpose for that is so that the sap on the pine trees isn't very, very sticky, therefore making it harder for you to hold on to the straw. We gather the straw off the tree 
um, usually a younger tree, no taller than about 12 to 13 feet, and that's max. Because the younger the tree, the more flexible the pine needles. We gather them green. We never gather them off the ground. The purpose for gathering them green is, for example, if you were to make a basket with just green straw or just wet straw, it is going to shrink. Therefore, all your stitches are gonna become loose. So we gather the straw green in the woods. Um, we bring it home. We usually then um, put it in a, a dark area with lots of air, about two weeks, and then the straw is dry. It's still green, just a little bit lighter color green. Um, then it's available and ready to start making your baskets. And that's a general, general process. If you were to start dyeing that straw, you can do it a natural way, which is where you use what's called black walnuts, yeah. sassafras root, and I'm sure y'all aware of those processes. Sure. Um, that's kind of across the board, I think, in Louisiana for dyeing purposes. But, but uh, so the three of us are definitely aware of both of those. Uh, but for yeah. those who might be watching us um, who aren't so familiar, maybe you, could you say a little bit about that? Sure. Um, when you are going to dye a natural material, for example, black walnut, which is found here in Louisiana, you would boil that. You would boil the black walnuts in a big pot or whatever you have available until you start to see the color start to come available. And then you can put in your straw or whatever material, um, even um, palmetto, or um, some people know it as river cane. You add that into that hot water because the heat is gonna adhere that color to that material. Afterward, I call it my second process is when you dry it again, that sets the color. But there's people who use um, other materials like the sassafras root. Um, Tom Colvin is, is excellent. And I know you guys know him. He's come up in almost every interview, I think. Is that correct, yeah. <laughs> Haley? Uh, Haley, I'm thinking Tom Colvin has come up in every interview so far. Am I right about that? Maybe so. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, go on. Had such an <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, do you, you mentioned river cane. Do you also make things out of river cane? I do not. I know how to do it. I just don't because in my area, the, it's not, it's extremely hard to find in the central Louisiana area, um, big enough to do anything with it. So that makes a difference also within Native American crafts is the availability of the material that you use. Do you find that you are still able to, do you find that the materials you use are still widely available or do you find, have you found them over the years harder to find, easier to it find? It is becoming harder to find. And the reason for that is because there was a big push in the early years for logging industry. And I use what's called the long leaf pine needle, which was indigenous to our area and prevalent all over the South at one point. But when the big companies came in, they wanted that larger, long, tall timber. That's what they, of course, cut down forests. And, and it wasn't until these later years that the Forest Service says, hey, maybe we should preserve some of this. So they started replanting it. Now, it's harder to find because of that reason. What I do find is a replant that the Forest Service has done. Um, I know some, I have some friends at the Cushata tribe, I'm sure I know them as well, Marjorie and them. Um, they drive actually a good ways. I think they said a couple of hours where they can find straw that they need. Whereas me, I only drive like 10, 15 minutes and I have, you know, an abundance at my, you know, area, but only in certain areas, not as nearly as abundant as it was at one point in time. And I would expect that years down the line, it's going to be like a lot of the other materials. It's going to be hard to find. Um, do you, you're a member of a non-federally recognized tribe. Have you find that that has an influence on how much you can campaign for preservation of some of the materials you use? Or is it, is it an issue when you try to do preservation work? Um, I actually have not tried to do preservation work. Um, I would imagine that it would have some influence. 
because, you know, as far as federal funding, of course, yes, it would. You would not get the federal funding grants that you would, you know, if you were a federal tribe. But in general, I think as an artist, um, I think it wouldn't affect it as much on an individual level. But if I did it on a state level, uh, it probably would affect it. Because, you know, in the world of today, government tells you what to do and what you can't do. They tell you you're Indian, they tell you you're not Indian. <laughs> um, I guess you, you talked about like some of the indigenous practices you, you engaged in. What are some cultural practices you might like to engage in or things you haven't done or maybe have done infrequently that you would like to learn more about or you would like you to know, do? You um, know, I met a friend when I was in New Orleans at the jazz festival. Um, she was actually from Africa and they were making the African baskets. Very, very similar to, way, to the way I do it, except they, I just kind of have to over between I'm, I'm, some of the African uh, art. Can you uh, hear me? Hold on, hold on <laughs> a second, Becky. Uh, Ida, uh, can I ask you, did you get that last sentence of hers? Was it just me that, can, that it garbled for or was it you too? Because I'm also having internet problems. I just wanted to know if the last sentence was garbled for me or for all of us. Okay, so, all right, yeah. So it seems like uh, we, d we didn't quite catch you. You said they were making a African baskets except for, could you repeat I can restate. That? Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. When I was at Jazz Festival, I met a lady there, and she was in the African area, and she made um, their traditional African baskets. We got okay. to talking and it was very similar, their practices to what Native Americans in the US does. And if I had the opportunity, I probably would take the opportunity to just get a feel for what they do and you know their practices of gathering and what it means to them as well. Um, it was just kind of fascinating that across you know lines, there's still some similarities in indigenous people from all over the world. Do you, have you, travel you've mentioned that some of your baskets are in collections in Europe have you traveled to talk about and display your baskets outside of the U.S. or, or have you traveled much in that regard around the U.S.? I've traveled around the U.S. Um, I've been to Mississippi um, Mississippi State and done some um, stuff there uh, and I helped was was trying to help another area in Mississippi uh, kind of do some revitalization with their um, basket weaving uh, with the pine needles because Mississippi Choctaws are more um, with the um, river cane. Okay. But there were some that were interested in doing um, the pine needle baskets because they have pine needles there as well. So I've done that. Um, like I said, I've taught at different universities, you know, small speakings about indigenous people and about my art and you know kind of how it came to be who's still doing it um so yeah it's it's gave me opportunities like that but i've never um actually taken the opportunity to go outside of the u.s i was invited to the smithsonian uh, my luck i got sick that year and couldn't go <laughs> <laughs> i know what's in a lifetime right yeah. and uh so yeah i mean i would love to I just haven't really had that opportunity yet or taken the opportunity I'll put it like that sure um you mentioned growing up you know with your um family and native people in Clifton up, up in uh, but in general who do you see as your community like when you think of who your community is who do you think of as your community? I think of my community as where I grew up. My cousins, my family, extended family that still live there, that still interact there, that um, that familiar face and, you know, that understanding that when you make a joke or you say something, they understand what you're talking about. That's my community. I live in my community. Hold on, I didn't quite hear what was the last sentence you said. If you could please repeat it, Becky. Okay. Sure. I said I live in Natchitoches Parish, but it's not my community. It's not okay. where I grew up. And 
it's not that familiar home surrounding. Uh, you're so a Clifton, Choctaw. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 you, no, please, you. Uh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say that Clifton is where I grew up. It's what I'm most familiar with. I still interact with everybody there. I don't foresee that ever changing. Um, most people that's married into the Clifton people, it's you would think that you're married into the outside family, but for some reason, <laughs> even divorcees still consider themselves a member and you know still come back because that's it's just that tight bond of familiar, you know, that family bond. Okay. Um how much, I mean, there are, you're in one Choctaw band in Louisiana. I think Louisiana has maybe five Choctaw bands. Mm -hmm. um, there are Choctaw people in Oklahoma. There are Choctaw mm -hmm. bands in Mississippi and in Alabama. How much do you identify or relate to that? I mean, your father has family in Oklahoma Choctaw or mm -hmm. you're descended from them. Uh, but what how much do you identify with the larger Choctaw identity the larger Choctaw world as a whole I identify equally as the same because the around the last push of Choctaws that actually went to Oklahoma was my dad's side of the family that's descending from King Brandy some of the Frasers McKinney's um feel like a tubby uh there's different ones that was probably the last ones was around 1910 in that particular family line. Um, I go and visit them. And shockingly enough, they're not much different from the families that I grew up around here. They, um, they're very, very family oriented. They do sing and dance and, and participate because they have a bigger opportunity than I do. I'm not a member of their tribe, but I'm a member of their family. So for me, it's, it's, not much difference. They, the ones that I know still live in rural areas in Oklahoma. They're still very, very family oriented. And they realized, you know, that their ancestors came from this area. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, generally, like, so you, you said you don't consider Natchitoches, the Natchitoches area really your, um, really part of your homeland, but how do you, how often, so when you travel outside of where you actually live right now, how often do you connect with the other Clifton Choctaw people or do you all meet up regularly? Is it a weekend thing or how, just how do you generally connect with them? Do you call each other? Yeah, well, my mom and dad and brother still live out there. My brother moved away and then moved back. Um, Tons and tons and tons of cousins still live there. So on a daily basis, I'm always connecting with them in some way, shape, or form. Um, for example, I got a call yesterday. Someone passed away in Chicago of Clifton community uh, member, and they call me for, you know, genealogy information and stuff like that. So I'm not their historian. I've done a lot, a lot of research, um, you know, within my own family and so I connect in many 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 different ways even like that because I try and you know help when I can to help to keep those older generations alive and known to today's. Um, what do you think are the if someone were to ask you what are the main elements of Clifton Choctaw culture now what would you say are the main elements of the culture? You mentioned family and mm -hmm. hunting, but generally, if someone said, "What, what are your, what is the stuff that you're, you consider to be the real parts of your culture?" What would you say it is now? Well, I think right now, culturally, a lot of the generation that's there now, they don't do a lot of the things that we used to do. They're interested in car shows and, you know, they still get together and play baseball games and stuff out there. But culturally, mostly they're identifying as Native Americans, but they're not really practicing. Um, it's only myself and my mother now that practice any Native American artwork of any sort. But the identification and um, they have what's called a tribal center out there. So they'll have like Easter egg hunts, um, Thanksgiving, uh, stuff like that, where they all, all community members are invited to participate. Those types of things, I think, is what kind of keeps them together nowadays. It's not so much 
like it was in the older days where they all got out and, you know, gathered corn and, you know, had syrup and stuff that they made at their house from the local, you know, sugar meal. So it's very different now than it used to be. Do you think it's, do you, does that concern you uh, that there are it elements does. that aren't being continued? It does because I think people get caught up in I'm Indian or I'm Native American and they don't stop to understand what makes them Native American. How did you get to that point in history and in your life? What makes you a Native American? You know, it's more than just saying that I'm Choctaw or I'm whatever. Indigenous people are alike in many ways. It doesn't have to be a, a certain name that connects you. I, in my personal opinion, um, for me, it's connecting to something that was traditionally done years and years ago that you still feel is an element that you have to continue because it makes you who you are, not just a name that connects you. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Um, it seems like your identity is very... I guess maybe I'm, I'm taking you to say like, you know, for some like the cultural practice isn't as much a part of their identity as maybe their ethnic heritage or that's sort of what you're saying or? In a sense, um, cultural practices does play a big role, but in my personal opinion is Native American, I don't care if you're 2% or if you 90%, you're still Native American. I think that it's it's your responsibility as an American, no matter what that percentage is, to find out as much as you can and try and preserve that. Even if you never knew anything about it before, the moment that you know that you're Native American, I believe it is your responsibility as an Indigenous person to learn as much as you can about that because it's going to fade fast. And any little information you can learn or give to me is, is at least being respectful to your Native American heritage. What do you think is necessary to continue uh, your Clifton Choctaw culture? Like, what do you think is, what would help to continue the culture, preserve it? I think um, with Clifton specifically is there, like most state tribes, they're kind of caught up in the I want to be federal, I want to be federal. But with, you know, with federal, and I know all of you know the ins and outs of that whole long process, which is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> but I think in order for Clifton to survive over time, you need to also add to that is teaching those younger children the importance of being Native, maybe do some type of language revitalization, that helps dramatically and continuing traditions and letting them understand that, you know, we've stood the test of time. This community has been here all this time. We're still on la original lands that they've had since the beginning. Those things matter as well as, you know, I want to be a federal tribe. Do you, are there, what's your general relationship with the Choctaw language? Um, I know there's, you know, a famous story in Brian Klopitek's book, uh, recognition odysseys which is you know yeah I, I, I knew him as well <laughs> uh, major section about the Clifton about you know a story about uh, one of your former chiefs you know speaking mobilian and the hospital with the person who would become the first chief of the federally recognized tuna Kabaluxi. Um do and that was I guess back in the 1980s so well within that was my great uncle <laughs> oh, okay so well within our lifetimes um uh, I, um, I, you know, I know in my own tribe, um, I did have some relatives who spoke Mobilian Lake when I was very young, um, but people who spoke Ishikoi or whatever were, you know, probably hadn't spoken it in a while by that point. Um, do you, yet sometimes words endure. Do you find that there are any Choctaw words or phrases that endure? Are there anyone still who speak Choctaw or Mobilian or mm. is that sort of part of your practice that, um, in your community or at the tribal center? Unfortunately, when my great uncle Paul Thomas died back in the early 90s, 
any knowledge of that died with him. No one was, I guess, uh, either interested in learning or just did not ask the right questions. Um, so unfortunately, there's no one there now that speaks Mobilian or anything like that. Um, I took an interest simply because I felt that it was something that needed to be, you know, preserved some kind of way. Um, I'm slow, slowly, slowly learning uh, because, you know, to learn another language is not something that you jump into. I don't true. care who you are. <laughs> it's true. Um, <laughs> especially Native American language, you know, I mean, you got to think about it totally backwards from English. So um, that is one of the major things I would love to see out there is, you know, is that revitalization? Because because I'll, let me put it to you like this. When I was in Oklahoma a couple of years ago visiting, uh, I was at a memorial for one of the Brandies that passed away. An older Choctaw guy, he was, he's actually half Lashada as well. Um, their last name is Ob, O-B-B. You may have heard of that last name. I'm not sure. Yeah. But he said to me something that kind of stuck with me. He said, the biggest trick he said that um, the white man, he said, did was tell Indian people that they didn't need their language anymore and they wasn't white. He says, when you did that, he says, you took away a large portion of what Native people believed. And it's true. If you think about it, it was not a good thing to be Native American at a certain point in time in history. So when you did that, you not only, you know, made them um, branch off into these other entities and areas to kind of assimilate but you took more than that. They took away your identity. Even till today, and I really hadn't thought about it that way, you know? You mentioned uh, visiting with uh, Choctaw people in other areas and uh, members of some other tribes. In general, like what sort of cultural activities have you adopted from indigenous peoples of other areas um, um, from where you might have traveled or lived? I don't know if I've really uh, changed much other than just knowledge. Um, well, I take that back. Um, you know, visiting Oklahoma, uh, some of my work stuff, I started trying to incorporate a little bit more of colors. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry. That I, was, um, sorry for a second, Becky. I didn't quite that last little bit. Okay. You said when I visited Oklahoma and then we couldn't catch what okay. was... Uh, yeah. Okay, so when I visited Oklahoma, um, they um, still actually have some of the, for example, Choctaws were known, at, you know, all over the place, specifically in, in the rattlesnake was, you'll find that all over their, their uh, effigies and stuff like that. Sure. So what I did was, you know, I kind of take, taken that and kind of started incorporating that in my basket weaving. So I did a basket where I had a rattlesnake wrap around it and, you know, and representing the Choctaw people. Um, so probably when I look at things, I look at things differently because <laughs> I'm always looking from an artistic eye. You know, how can I incorporate that into something I'm doing? Um, so I would say that is what was kind of um, I took home with me was some of the old ways and the old symbols and how could I make that visible to the public. Um, does that make you notice rattlesnakes more when you're around there? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we have them here in Orleans yeah. Parish and I have seen exactly one. <laughs> and fortunately it let me know that it was there. Um, <laughs> but uh, is that, does you think that makes you notice certain things more or just like maybe look for things more? Probably. Yeah, uh, unfortunately for us here, and I live right at the base of the Kasachi National Forest. Um, and let me tell you something, I've seen so many rattlesnakes till I've seen well above what I feel like I should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, very respectful of them, but at a distance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, are you often... I mean, you, you are a public figure in terms of being a, a native artist, um, but in your, just in general, are you often off, asked to talk about your indigenous background or do people like ask you to talk about it when they run across you in the street or in your, you know, your life as a social worker? Are you often asked Not to talk really. about it? Not really. Sometimes, you know, if I'm somewhere and 
somebody may ask me, you know, hey, you look Native American or you look Creole or you look Hispanic. I can't tell you how many Hispanics I've had speak to me. I don't know anything about Spanish language. <laughs> but then if, if I have the opportunity, then yeah, I'll give them a little information about, you know, about me or usually not so much about me, but probably more of where I come from. Um, so yeah, I mean, I do some. I do um, a lot of research. That's another thing I love to do. Um, I worked at the Creole Heritage Center at NSU for several, oh. several years. And oh, I yeah. helped them, mm -hmm. and I, I actually still do some work for them. And I helped them with a lot of their genealogy stuff, helping other communities. Um, so I've done a lot of research. Um, I now do a lot of the DNA genetic stuff. Um, you know, you would be shocked at the Native American connections in Louisiana across the board. People will say, oh, well, I don't have a 2% Native American. But that doesn't mean anything because let me tell you, I've seen some 2% and their, their timeline go way back. Yeah. <laughs> way back and connect to communities that they never knew they had. Um, I guess uh, thinking about uh, the audience for what we've been talking about. I mean, we're going to the publicly available archive that we're creating, and then also a book project. What have we not talked about yet that you think they might want to? They might want to know or. Mm -hmm. I think we've covered the majority. Um, what I'm trying to do personally, and which I think would help a lot of the Native Americans in Louisiana, is as I'm doing research in my own family and my on my dad's own line, I see a big overlap in some of the Native American communities, and that is with surnames, um, indigenous people, and how they moved around. Right. I would love to see um, other communities get a little more involved because for my own self, um, I, I see a huge overlap with Mississippi, the Coshadas, and the Oklahoma Choctaws. As far as DNA sequencing goes, it's there. You can see the families. And if you know how to trace it, you can actually see the movement through time in areas. And so... I'm hopefully going to try and, and I'm putting together a ginormous database. Don't know when it's ever going to be finished, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I would love to see that publicly put out there because some people just need that help at more identification of where they're from. Who would you like to be the audience for uh, the project we're working on? Who do you think you would like to have? I think material. that a lot of these smaller tribes, these state tribes, these up and coming tribes that are looking for that placement and where they belong would be the prime target. Because one of the hardest things when you are trying to, you know, be identified is where are you from? Who's your family? Where were they across time? They're digging through these archives when we live in 2021. If you understand genetics and if you understand where to look for in research, identifying people and where they were in placements. I'm Names sorry, change. Quite, well, why did it change? I'm sorry, Becca. I didn't quite hear the last sentence. Okay. If you know where to look for and then. If then you know you where to look and what regions to look in, what ideas and names you're searching you would be surprised the information that's out there for free. I mean, uh, you know, and it's just a matter of being willing to help people. Uh, that's an interesting phrase. You used a phrase in the, um, when we were talking just now, up and coming tribes, which I find fascinating because, and I, I <laughs> so, and, I, and I'm just going to uh, tell you, like, uh, I look behind your head and I see the Handbook of North American Indians behind your head on the bookshelf. Oh, we're on Zoom. <laughs> and, I wouldn't even uh, pay any attention to what's back there. And um, I'm a former librarian, or I guess still a librarian, librarian by training, and I just maybe know, notice books more. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but one thing I do uh, note is that in Handbook of North American Indians, you know, 
uh, I mean, I'm a Takapa Ishak, and we are the person who some, I guess the anthropologist who wrote the article on us, who apparently doesn't have an internet connection, which is sad for anthropologists, uh, <laughs> lists us as being, you know, extinct really. And there are four very well-organized bands right now that I know yep. of, you know, who have yep. our own websites. We do language work, cultural work. And I mean, he obviously just never looked like that's, I mean, it's kind of lazy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I won't even mention him by name because he doesn't even deserve, I'm just going to say he doesn't exist. So, there you um, go. But it's interesting because sometimes there will be uh, tribes that will have sort of cultural revitalization. So like we talked to Robert Caldwell. Mm -hmm. I know him. Um, and I just think of how much work Robert has done. And I think a lot more people know about his tribal culture because of writers like Robert Caldwell, also Thomas mm -hmm. Perry, the poet who's from um, the Choctaw Apache tribe of Ibar. It mm -hmm. does seem like sometimes um, some non-federal tribes need certain individual people to kind of promote their tribal culture, like Rosina Philippe and the Atakapa tribe down in um, Grand Bayou. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit more on like what it means to be an up and coming tribe uh, in the sense that so, you're, so you're simultaneously, I mean, you're the <laughs> oldest cultural people in the area, but also up and coming. Can you talk about that a bit? So when I say up and coming, that is literally for the white man. <laughs> <laughs> I am literally saying that phrase literally for the white man because I know for a fact your tribe specifically and it's ironic I was just doing some reading a couple days ago and it was an interview and if I can find it I will email it to you because I run across stuff and I email to people all the time and it was in a one of a time an email and she was talking about her attack a pop people and I'm thinking to myself as I have many times these people were never lost ever they've been there the whole time that is a statement that is strictly political you can't lose something that was never lost and I give you that example because Clifton was the same way but we found the Indians you can't find something that was never lost you know <laughs> and that's one of probably my biggest pet peeves is when people say, hey, who are you? Where did you come from? I never heard of that. Well, just because you never heard of that doesn't mean that we had to go announce to the world who we were so that everybody was aware. <laughs> <laughs> do you think you it's know, Maybe you didn't want people to know. Do you, so I guess, uh, do you feel it's important for the non-federally recognized tribes to make people aware now? As a, uh, Do you think that's a responsibility or or a, a big advantage now, maybe with the internet of making people aware? Is that some of the things you, re you really are? I do. I highly, highly, highly recommend, you know, the people that but take advantage of technology today, take advantage of another scholar that you trust and that you know is going to give you the truth. Take advantage to let people know who you are and don't ever worry about what people say about you because no matter what you do, they're always going to have something negative to say. But as far as the attack upon people, I've ran across documents and I know for a fact that they were there. A lot of the Choctaws that were originally to these areas that went to Mississippi, went to Oklahoma, lived right there among them all the way. And I know for a fact, all the way from Mamu, Fury Flat, um, Spring, all of those areas was heavily, heavily Native American at one point in time, especially around the, the mid to late 1800s. They were interacting daily. They were never lost. They just right. chose to say, hey, I don't want to pull with y'all over there. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that's my take on it. You mentioned some of the um, struggles of preserving your cultural identity. What gives you hope? What, what are some hopeful I hope things? that with 20 hopeful things would be tribal communities that are taking their people and bringing them to the forefront now, um, letting people know, hey, we've always been here. We're still here. And now it's time for us to put our voice forward. You know, I am hopeful that a lot of the state tribes, non-state tribes, Native American people will raise their voice before we get to a point in history where it's totally forgotten again. 
um, you know, that's extremely important. What would you like to leave behind for future generations? You personally? Personally, I would love to leave information, who they are, who was your people. A lot of people today want to know where did they come from, who are your people, and what were your struggles. If I had, if I could leave that behind for my people, my struggles, or even other Native Americans, I would so do that. They need to understand that who you are today has not been easy to get here. And I don't foresee it being any easier in the future. How would you like to be portrayed? That I cared enough about my heritage and other indigenous people that I spoke up and was willing to help anybody that needed it. Thank you, uh, Becky. I, I'm pretty much wrapped up with the specific questions I had lined up for you. And Haley undoubtedly has some questions. Haley, I, I take it that is true. And uh, maybe uh, Haley would <laughs> like to ask you some questions. Yeah. yeah. Thank you sure. so much for your, thanks so much for your time and your, your comments. I wanted to loop back on three things that I heard that were, uh, that I was curious about. The first okay. was, um, was I wanted to know a little bit, I was just curious to know, do you participate in the Intertribal Basketry Summit? I do, every year. Do you want to, uh, for, the, for the listeners at home, can you talk a little bit about what that is and, and what you do with it? That is where the Native American uh, artists get together and they, um, it's a great time for us to fellowship new ideas, what's going on, get in touch with family, how's everybody doing. But it's important because you get to see what's going on specifically in Native American culture today. Is it just with your tribe? No, there's other tribes. Um, there's Quixadas, um, there's even state recognized tribes, because of course mine is. It's just kind of across the board. Um, Tom called in another name familiar. <laughs> He's also there. And, you know, so it's an opportunity for everybody and they give it to the public as well to come and see what's going on in Louisiana. Who can you meet or what other tribes are doing and even in the Alabama um, Quixadas. So it's, it's kind of across the board, but it's so very interesting because you get to see the people and you get to see them do their artwork, um, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. They'll even sit down with you because I do. You want to see how it feels to, to you know, basket weave? Here you go. So it's a great opportunity. Great opportunity for people to go and see is this a Is this an invitational? Are people allowed to go? To, is the general public allowed to go to this? Or is this a closed thing for tribal members? The general public is allowed to go. But to actually participate, um, you know, at a table, you're invited. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So if, you know, if, if somebody wanted to go to the, to the basket summit and observe and watch and talk, they can definitely do that. Oh, yes, because um, there's tables set up, and I help usually each year with that. There's a specific table that's set up um, that, the, that the tunicas do, and they'll pick some of us each year to say, hey, can you help with this table? And that's specifically for teaching outside people how to do Native American crafts. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I, so another thing that I'm thinking of is basket weaving and, and your art within that. Um, I'm thinking as an artist, there's things that you try to reflect within the things that you're creating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's thoughts of, you know, reflecting the past and making sure you're doing uh, justice to the people who have taught you the skill. And then there's also this thought of, you know, the reason you're doing this is to develop something and also to express something within yourself. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you know, what are the skill things that you feel like you, you concentrate and focus on replicating to be true to your past? And then what are the parts within your art that you're trying to add and, and develop and, and let the audience know that's something that you think is important? And that's a great question. This is the reason why. Most of the artists I know, we do focus on tradition, but there's also what they call contemporary art. I specifically do that as well. So when I'm developing a new basket, um, I do effigies. Effigies are um, animals that are, you know, crafted into your basket or it's either shaped. It just depends on the artist. Mine, I can usually either shape, for example, a turkey or armadillo or something like that. 
Um, or I can also incorporate that image woven into a regular traditional basket. Oh, wait, so you're, I'm sorry, I'm, I think I'm just understanding this. So you're weaving an effigy or you're weaving a sculpture almost that's in right. the shape of the animal? Oh, that's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is um, that traditional or is that something that it you're is. contemporary? That's traditional. Um, it's traditional, especially with the Pochadas and the Choctaw. You'll find that a lot because effigies meant a lot. Um, for example, um, I do a turtle. Um, I've done them life size and I've done them small. It literally is in the shape of a turtle. It's, you know, all images. I use pine needle, uh, pine cones. Um, sometimes I'll dye the pine cones as well as a straw to, to, you know, make a basket look whatever way that I'm trying to, you know, get something to look. Um, I do something called the red wing blackbird basket. That's a red wing blackbird is in my area. So I'll dye my straw black and I will add red and uh, other forms of black in the basket. That's not traditional. That's more contemporary because they would have been dying and incorporating stuff like that, you know, when traditionally. Um, I do it because it brings awareness again to my area. I have two questions. The first is, um, can you talk a little bit about the historical significance of effigies? And then can you also talk a little bit about um, how, how making these contemporary structures brings awareness to your area? Well, um, when it comes to effigies, I'm not as versed on them as say a Cushada because Choctaws didn't have plans. We didn't have that. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas the Cushadas did. They had like the turkey clan or the turtle clan. That is where the effigies would have come in specifically for them. In other words, um, a Choctaw, I mean, a, let's say you had two people that belong to the same bear clan, for example. They could not marry each other. They couldn't date, they couldn't do anything, but they could, one of the other clans may have been say the um, turkey clan. So the clans meant different things to different tribes. Um, Choctaws never really were really in, clan, in clans. They were more hierarchy stuff. Um, but they also though acknowledged the refugees and those things as significant, mm -hmm. um, but just in a different way. They were, they were doing stuff like that in terms of um, hunting, um, just different meanings not quite the same as a clan type of um, traditional community type thing. But uh, in today's effigies, it still means the same, you know, um, you'll see certain community, for example, I was talking earlier about Choctaws were known for rattlesnake. I incorporate that in some of my baskets um, because it represents Choctaw people. And it also represents Louisiana and my area. So, um, People usually try to incorporate things that are familiar, mean something to them, and that would be where that would come in. Could you talk a little bit about, you were talking earlier that um, these contemporary structures and these non-traditional um, dyes and, and sculpture methods that you're using within basketry, you're using to bring awareness to your area. Can you talk a little bit about what that, how exactly you're doing that and what that means and why it's important to you? For example, I'm working on a um, egret. Um, it's going to be a life-size basket. Wow. Um, with the legs and everything. Um, mm -hmm. That is requiring, you know, definitely commercial stuff. Um, I have some wiring on the inside um, to shape it. Um, but the basket is actually the body and the head and that type of stuff. And those are definitely known to Louisiana. Um and I think that's just awesome. I also am working on a heron. So, you know, I try and pick things that are familiar to me and that I, I love in nature. And I think it represents Louisiana because, for example, if somebody bought that basket from Europe, there's a story with it. You know, this is an indigenous bird. This came from here. This is why it was made. So, you know, sometimes you can speak through your art rather than through words. And so when I sell somebody a basket or give somebody a basket, I make sure they know that. So that would be more contemporary than it would be traditional. Traditional would be your more of your oval shaped baskets with certain colors. 
with lead, without, or some effigies. But these larger effigies in more specific and detail, that's more contemporary now. How does the, um, how does the intertribal basketry summit feel about these new contemporary designs? <laughs> they love it. They uh -huh. love it. I mean, it's, it's an opportunity to show you that this artist is cares enough about what they do to take their basket working or their artwork to another level. It shows that you care enough that you're not stuck in one rut, that you're able to keep that traditional stuff alive, but you're able to also understand that this is a new world and you may get through to people that are in a younger age and they also want to see how do they fit into this world. That's where your contemporary would come in and you're going to bridge the two together like that. Um, I, I like, I want to ask a few more questions about some technical mm -hmm. things, but I want to, the last question I have about basketry is I've always found it interesting that, um, could you talk a little bit about um, what type of care or, you know, if someone purchases a basket, you know, it's, it's almost like a living thing. Could you talk a little right. bit about like personal care, <laughs> care and hygiene yeah. of your basket app post purchase? No, um, because it's a natural product. You want to keep it away from the light and you really want to keep it behind a glass if possible. And what that does is preserve that for years and years and years to come. It also brings the value up on baskets. I'm also, I also do, um, I always say what I'm looking for, just because I'm listening and waiting. Um, appraise, sorry. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. <laughs> I also appraise baskets because I've been doing it for so long. I can kind of look at a basket and tell you about the age, possibly who did it. Oh. It's extremely important. Sorry, you Becky. A basket you, uh, for years. Becky, you, you cut out there. I heard the age and then you garbled. Okay, um, I've done this so long that I can kind of appraise baskets as to their value and, um, you know, who made it sometimes. Um, also, um, the value. Preservation is extremely important with any kind of Native American basketry because if it's, if it's you know, susceptible to elements outside and sunlight, that's going to start breaking that material down. And if somebody's taken months to create that for you, you want to keep that forever. Because, for example, um, Ms. Lorena Langley, I think it's Lorena Langley, but she's a Langley. Um, she passed away several years ago. One of her baskets went to the, to the Smithsonian. Now, the person who purchased that basket paid 50 bucks for this large 12-inch you know, diameter basket. It's valued at $16,000 today. Wow. So, you know... I try and educate people on that as well. You know, if you're just getting a basket because you just kind of want to get it, that's fine. But if you're getting a basket to pass down to other generations of your family, you want to preserve it. And you preserve that through keeping it away from direct sunlight and possibly behind get a glass if possible. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, thank you for that. It, it feels like almost like a, a relationship once you have a, have a <laughs> basket because it's... It is. Yeah. Because, you know, the artist puts so much work and time, not just in the weaving, but they went out and gathered the materials, took the time to bring it back, put all of it together, and then they were satisfied with the product. So it's a lot goes into it. <laughs> yeah. I'm interested about, like, um, so you brought up, I was hearing this juxtaposition between, you know, these these very old traditional skills that you're you're interested in passing on and um, and kind of developing contemporary uses for and you know making sure it it, it thrives and continues, um, and then you also have this focus on um, you know um, contemporary in the moment within your social work and you know direct community action, um, but then you also have this futurism aspect of you know this DNA sequencing that you find you know uh useful mm -hmm. and important I was wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that futurism or that you know how why do you think DNA sequencing is important and you know kind of go off on that? um that's kind of an individual preference um I find it interesting because it has connected so many communities to people they never knew they knew and then once, see, DNA sequencing is just one tool in research. It's a stepping stone to get you to where you need to back that up through the old-fashioned genealogy research. 
when you've had those hand in hand then you know what you're seeing is accurate. Um, I can say that I've seen DNA connect certain communities through surnames and you know they took those old folk tales and actually put it to a face or a community or a family member. It's important to some people but it's also important to know that DNA is in its early, early stages. There's not a large population right now for any of the testing companies to give you an accurate percentage because it's just not that big of a pool of Native Americans who've tested. That is the glitch, so to speak, in DNA sequencing and DNA testing today. You have a large Caucasian, you know, European descent pool to choose from. They can kind of pinpoint areas and families pretty accurately, you know, because of the nature and how many they've tested. Same thing with African Americans. They can pretty much pinpoint because they have a larger base. But think about it. Native Americans, there's not that many that are willing to test more, I would say, now than I've ever seen. But with that said, you know, you got to use that DNA as a stepping stone to get to where you're looking to get to. Could you talk a little bit about why um, Native, you were saying that there are large pools for certain populations, but Native Americans seem to have a lower amount of people in the DNA sequencing mm -hmm. data pool. Could you talk a little bit about um, why some people may have hesitance about around that? Sure, because, you know, a lot of the federal tribes, you know, they have different um, regulations that allow people in their tribe. For example, Mississippi Choctaws, you got to be half you know, Native American to get in. That doesn't mean half of your DNA. That just means half of your ancestry has to be linked back far enough to where they consider you half. Whereas Oklahoma, they link you, you're able to get in the tribe if you have a descendant that was on the doll's roll or direct descendant that later became a member. Um, so I think a lot of these communities and these indigenous people are scared that if they got their DNA done and they see that European or they see that African American, that they're going to lose some type of identity or some type of federal, you know, placement in their communities. That's a scary thought for Native Americans who fought so hard to be who they are. And I think that is the big factor that's stopping them from, um, pursuing those avenues. So that's why I say it's really a personal preference when you do that. It's if you feel you're missing some elements of your ancestry and you want to know, that's the way to go. But it's a stepping stone. But yeah, Native Americans are very leery of that. Matter of fact, I think part, it's a section of the Navajo tribe that's banded. They, they're not allowed to do it at all. Wow. Could you talk a little bit about why, um, I'm curious to know like um, you were, you talked a little bit about why people may be hesitant to do this. And then you were also talking about how you think that it, it's such a great thing. Can you talk about, can you walk people through like sure. your, your thoughts and, and how you got to the point to feel like this is definitely something that you would encourage so, people to do? For example, if most people that get their DNA done are looking for one or two things, they're missing some people, they don't know who those people were, or they're missing a relative or a father. Or in some cases, for example, let's say it's a tribe that they did a lot of research and they just don't really see what they need to see. Well, that's because maybe those documents aren't available or a name changed over time. Extremely common with Native Americans. It's very, very common. Let's say you did your DNA and you're looking at it and you're like, oh my God, I have three to 5,000 matches. I have no idea who these people are. And they're like, you know, anywhere from ranging third to fourth to fifth and above cousins. But the thing that could be beneficial to that is some of them have trees. And they've built their family trees. If their tree is particularly accurate, you might look at that and say, hey, I know that name. That's a missing link in something that I'm trying to find for this specific area. In a case like that, it can be beneficial because you can find information there but there's no other way you'd find it. In today's technology and the way things are, are happening so fast and quickly, I think that there's benefits with DNA. It just depends on the person and what you're looking for. There's also privacy. You don't have to have your, your information public. If you're using it just for your own benefit or to, to break a, um, a brick wall in your genealogy, that's the way to go. But it's a, it's a big chore 
but I've learned over the years how to read it and how to recognize and how to use it. And I think it's a benefit to quite a process, but it depends on the purpose. I'm sorry, we you, we lost you at benefit, Becky. Oh, I'm sorry. I <laughs> think it can be a benefit, especially if you're missing elements in tribes and you're looking for those certain members and you don't know where to go from a certain point. You never know who's had their DNA done. There's a lot that links those together. I know specifically with my dad's, my dad matches over eight to 900 Choctaws. And I didn't go by just what I saw on there. I went by, um, you know, the research, the paperwork, everything lined up to match that. So it just depends on what you're looking for. Makes sense. One thing that you you just said there that was I, I think the readers may be curious, or li- listeners may be curious about is uh, you were talking about um, you know sometimes you hit brick walls within genealogy. Um, I'm wondering, do you did you have that experience while you were doing genealogy? And there was, was there anything specific about um, looking up indigenous ancestors that that may cause brick walls that you could talk about? Sure. I mean, you, well, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. But... Yeah. That's what, that's what I'm hoping you'll talk about. Yeah. So for example, um, in my dad's DNA, I'll use his as an example specifically for indigenous. This is his Choctaw line that links back to Oklahoma. Well, his Brandy descendant, his name was King Brandy. He was born about 1812, had many, many, many sons and grandsons. Well, I'm, you know, going through that line because I know that's my dad's, the DNA matches, and, and I know the family, so I know it's correct. Well, lo and behold, in the other family that was looking for one of King Brandy's, oops, can you yeah. hear me? Lo and behold. <laughs> okay. Lo and behold, there was a family in Oklahoma that could not find their grandfather, who's a Brandy. Well, I use newspaper, you know, every element that I can find to find information. Well, it just so happened that I posted on on the Oklahoma site a newspaper clipping back in about 1880 area of one of King Brandy's sons stabbed one of his cousins after working for a white man in a field. They gotten drunk and gotten mad at each other. So the, the lady says, oh, my God, I know that name. That is my great grandfather. I've been wondering, you know, what happened. They never thought to look in Louisiana. And if it wouldn't have been for that one little blip in a newspaper that matched my dad's DNA, they would never knew to look for that. Yeah. I mean, it's like a needle in a haystack. So it was just coincidental that my dad's DNA matched this particular relative that I had become, you know, really good friends with and posted it. So yeah that's some of the bad because unfortunately the grandfather was killed by a cousin but (laughs) but at least they found that missing link you know Mm -hmm. and his name changed so interesting interesting Mm -hmm. um well yeah i think that was my um those were my main curiosities um uh the other thing that i wanted to talk a little bit about was you mentioned green corn earlier um way back in the interview. I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that. (laughs) Yes. Growing up, um, my mom and them, they grow corn. They called it field corn. Um, I think some of the farmers might call it cow corn. I'm not really sure. I know that it's field corn. It's not sweet. They would grow it. But before it would become to full maturity, they would pull it off the corn stalks and take this... um, They wouldn't let it dry. It would have to be green and scrape all of the, I call it juice. I'm not sure what you call it, (laughs) out of each kernel. Then cook it and it becomes this thick kind of mush like stuff. And then they would, you know, put in, you know, bacon or whatever else they wanted with it. And that is actually a green corn. Well, I didn't know until many years later um, when I went to Oklahoma that they do that up there. So that was something that was left behind, I think, from early Choctaws. And nobody around us did that. I thought they did, but they didn't. And here it was years later in Oklahoma. Well, that's the norm for them. They eat that all the time. So, you know, um, 
that's been a tradition in my family as long as I can remember and as long as my mom and dad can remember. So that's, I guess, an example of tradition that gets passed on sometime and you don't really know exactly where it came from. For what it is, yeah. For what it is, yeah. That's cool. Um, well, yeah, I think that that was all that I had. Um, Ida, did you have anything? Or Jeffrey, did you have any other questions? Uh, yeah, I, I did want to return a bit to the um, to the effigy baskets. I have I am familiar with the effigy baskets from that uh, Kushada make. Uh, did you learn mm -hmm. the effigy basket tradition from them, or was that? I guess that that was uh, curious because I mm -hmm. I didn't recall having ever seen Chaka effigy baskets. I'm not really a basket expert, but. Um, but but I was wondering if like that's no, where you learned the effigy mom, baskets or what? No, my mom and them has kind of always made them. Oh, okay. Um, I think I think that knowing what I know now about the Choctaws and Pochadas, there's an overlap there. But um, we've kind of always made the effigy baskets, but Pochada does really really well with it, and I just kind of come along and and I guess kind of perfected it so to speak um but no we're not at Choctaws aren't known as well as the Kushadas excuse me for making effigy baskets all right thank you that's that's the only question I had <laughs> uh Haley uh, so um definitely we wish to say a coquetito to you thank you very mm -hmm. much for being involved with this project and for all of your really wonderful comments. It's just so much to think about. Um, <laughs> every person we've interviewed so far, you know, has been a serious indigenous cultural practitioner. One person who does a lot of dance, a uh, person who's a writer, a person who's a scholar, works on food ways. And just like <laughs> it's, it's very inspirational just to see yeah. people, you know, like, it's just so, so good for the project. And I really thank you for taking the time to, yeah. to speak with us. And of course, when we have everything all finished and everything, we, you know, like we want this to be a resource that mm -hmm. um, members of your community can use. You right. know, and we hope this will turn into a much larger project. We're starting with just a few people, but we're hoping that this is something that will really take off because I think it is providing something that doesn't exist. And generally, it's Correct. members of our communities speaking in our own voices, and that's what we're trying to do. And thank uh, you for allowing me to uh, to come on and speak. Thank you, uh, Haley. You have anything else uh, you would no. like to say? No. Thanks for signing up <laughs> and doing this. <laughs> it was really great to meet you. I, I really appreciated listening to to what you were what you were saying, and I feel like I learned a lot. Um, I don't know. I, I see like the, you know, I'm just, I, I'm seeing my mind, like the metaphor between or the connection between like, you know, you know, social intricacies or social work and then, you know, genealogy <laughs> and like how that is kind of basket weaving in its own sense. Actually, I have one more yeah. question now that you mentioned that, Haley, because I <laughs> thought about this. Uh, you are a social worker, so that makes you kind of a medical professional. Um, uh -huh. Do you, how, is your approach to healing or therapy influenced by your heritage? I think so, because um, there's a small, I, I like mental health. That's my area. And there's a small turn in today's medical um, area where they, you know, trying to take into consideration that there's that outside influence other medicinal purposes that might help that. But I think being Native American, I tend to try and look a little deeper into what the problem is. Is it social? Is it your community? Or is it people just not understanding you? So I think that brings something a little bit different to the table for me when I'm working with people, because I'm not only looking at it in my, my realm of social work, I'm looking at it in a different type of social you know, scenario as well. Thank you so much. I meant to ask that before, but then you got involved. Like, you know how it is, you get involved in the conversation. Oh, yeah. And you were saying yeah. too much other stuff that's interesting. So, <laughs> like, slip yeah. uh, All right. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Becky. And um, thank you, Ida, for making all the technical stuff happen, et cetera.